when COVID-19 hit us in the spring of 2020. The pandemic sent the world reeling. Forcing us to shut down economies. Forcing us to recalibrate our normal. Forcing us to confront the what's next. What's next for jobs. For education. For families. And our health and well-being. This podcast ponders how we will live in this COVID era. What's on the horizon? What should we expect? Where are the opportunities? We explore the what's next in the next next normal. normal. Hello, I'm Aaron Trafford. I'm Dave Trafford. And welcome to The Next Normal, episode one. Today, we are digging in with our hosts on what I think it's fair to say is a pretty big concept, but it's an important and foundational one to the conversations that we're going to have over the course of the show. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really going to get at every time we turn a page on what's next in The Next Normal, we're going to get at what we're starting with, and that is meaning. We're going Mm -hmm. to really drill down on our own ideas and understandings of meaning. And that could be the meaning of certain words, the meaning of certain rituals, um, the meaning of our values. So we're we're thrilled to have Lisa Taylor. She is one of our hosts, president of Challenge Factory. Her her expertise is in the future of work. Dave Hardy is the uh, president of Hardy Stevenson's and Associates, also the executive director of the Institute of New Suburbanism. And Aaron, he's uh, he's actually he sounds like a real quiet kind of casual sort of guy, easy going, but he's seen as a real outlier in the urban planning setting. I mean, he's a he's a revolutionary, so he's great to hear from him. Yeah, I was gonna say he's a quiet rabble rouser. We also have uh, Sarah Thorne here with us. She's the president and CEO at Decision Partners. Her expertise is in risk, decision making, and behavior, and how that applies to government policy. And her insight through this whole series is going to be critical. Yeah. And then it, we come to Ujwal Arkalgood, who is our resident cultural anthropologist on the show. And Doesn't that I just have sound to tell cool? you, it just <laughs> right? sounds cool. And he's a cool yeah. guy. And we're starting uh, the next normal uh, kind of following Ujwal's lead because his whole business is the business of meaning. And let me tell you that. Every time Ujwal opens his mouth with something, I'm always curious to see where he's going to take it because it never goes where I expect it to go. So, uh, you know, and this conversation is 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 no different. I actually want to start with a story. A couple of days ago, there were a bunch of construction workers outside my house doing some work. My three-year-old looks outside and she sees a man without a shirt and she goes, Daddy, look that construction worker is hot. And then my wife walks over to the window. She looks at the man, turns around, and says, he is hot. <laughs> now, it's a classic example because in, in that scenario, the same word had two implied meanings. In the first one, hopefully, that's what my daughter went, meant, was uh, implying that he was actually warm, he was hot, while my wife implied that he was good looking or attractive. I bring this example up because We all innately understand this, no matter what language we speak or languages we speak. Words have duality, have multiple meanings in different contexts. But the funny thing is, when you apply that to topics, issues, concepts in culture, we somehow forget that because we're so used to following a rule book like the dictionary. Or if you take a concept like gut health or our overall health, we're used to following the rule book, i.e. some sort of scientific literature. And this is what fascinates me about culture, which is that actually this notion of meaning, this notion that meaning is contextual and changes and evolves with time applies to pretty much everything, any concept, any idea, any issue, trend in culture, in society. And it certainly applies to a lot of the issues that have bothered all of us as human beings through this pandemic. So that's what I'm interested in unpacking a little bit with with the group here, because I think this is this is fascinating to me as an anthropologist, but also I think just fascinating as, as human beings, because and I'll give you one classic example. If you compare how most of us thought about our health in 2019 to how we think about it in 2021, there is a complete transformation in the average level of knowledge 
all of us and all of us now have about sort of the dangers, the invisible dangers lurking out there. A lot of us didn't even think about this a couple of years ago, like the way we do now. I mean, I, 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 have, I, I watch people, friends of mine who never even wash their hands before, you know, having a drink or having a bite to eat who are now walking around with hand sanitizers. And this is not just because of the pandemic, this is because a lot of us have gained new knowledge. And I think that's what's fascinating because it's changed the meanings around our health. So let me ask you, because one of the things that you're kind of touching on at the heart of all of this is our, and I have said this a number of times during my radio show and other podcasts, is that this has really made us confront what we look at in terms of value in our lives, uh, whether that's monetary value or just the sort of personal values and how we conduct ourselves uh, that would inform some of the behaviors that you're talking about. Have you seen a shift in how we have changed or have reinforced the meaning of value? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a big question, but fundamentally what we do find is that, you know, if you think about the things we value in our lives, so I'm, I'm not talking about our values as human beings, our belief systems, whether it's political, social values, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the things we value in our lives, whether it's time with family, the outdoors, a lot of those types of values have definitely changed. Uh, there is a newfound appreciation for being able to get outside, for being able to maintain, build, strengthen human relationships. A lot of that has changed. One of the fascinating areas of change is how we think about joy in our lives as mm. well. So this is something we've been studying actually for a lot of large corporations. A and, you know, joy was associated with a lot of physical things, owning things and, and objects and, and, you know, from cars and houses to uh, watches and so on. And a lot of the meanings around that have changed and are changing. And it's sort of, it's sort of like the pandemic has functioned like a bit of a vacuum tube. It's just accelerated change. Meaning always changes. It's just the pandemic has accelerated it in certain areas. So I'm, I want the rest of the crew to jump in at, at any point if there's something that uh, piques your interest or we want clarified. But uh, let me just go to you, uh, uh, Sarah, because, you know, you and I connected about a year ago and this is just sort of halfway through wave one. And I know you were doing some work and specifically uh, monitoring how Canadians were coping with the pandemic at the time and really drilling down on their behavior and the things that inform their behavior around the, the, the pandemic and their own understanding of the pandemic. And what I thought was interesting is that when I listened back to that interview that you and I did back in May of 2020, we're still talking about the same issues that people are, are coping with. And so that it really has informed and instilled and impacted their behavior. It absolutely has. And I, I thought the same thing when I listened back. Um, first of all, when we were talking at the end of May, I think the two of us were talking about something that was going to come to an end at some point quite soon. And one of the things that we were talking about was that people were making they were making their own decisions. They were taking risk assessment into their own hands and trying to make decisions about trade-offs, what they could do and couldn't do and what they felt comfortable doing and what kind of self-protective behaviors, whether or not they would go to a restaurant or ride public transportation. And here we are over a year later, we are making those same decisions, only much, many more decisions and much more complex now. And, you know, I think it matters so much, you know, what Ujwal was saying about language and about words, because we have to find a new way to connect and communicate with people as they're trying to make these decisions. A recent study I saw um, was asking Canadians about their mental health and f during the pandemic and 50% said that, um, you know, they had had mental health issues. Their mental health had declined with the pandemic. And yeah, I think Dave, you and I were talking about this. My perception is that probably the other 50% were telling the truth <laughs> or <laughs> yeah, exactly. the question was not asked properly because everybody will tell you that they have experienced loss during the pandemic. 
how they experience it, the kind of experience they've had has been different. But everybody has lost something. I'm not saying that people haven't also gained things, but they have lost something. And, mm-hmm. you know, as you were saying as well, if we could find a better way to connect with people and get them to talk about that experience, to share what they've lost, what they're sad about, what they're looking forward to, it's going to help us transition to the next place, which is not going to be what we left in 2019. It's going to be mm-hmm. a different place. Yeah, Dave Hardy, you know, aside from your urban planning pr- professional uh, activities, you are a, a facilitator at some meetings that can kind of get difficult. And I think one of the skills that you bring to the table is you're, you're quite literally a professional listener. And it gets to the point that, that Sarah was making that if we've learned nothing else, perhaps we're learning to be better listeners. I think we have. Um, What's just to pick up on Sarah, Sarah's comment uh, as well is that we need to have a dialogue uh, on the points that uh, both Ujwal and Sarah were raising um, to drill down on what are what's really going on in, in people's lives. Uh, one thing as a planner I'm noticing is that um, we're, our values are changing in terms of where we live and how we live, and <clears throat> we're reassessing. Uh, should we be living in the core of a city? Uh, we're rethinking living in a suburban or rural area. We can see a transition now of a lot of people, Toronto, you know, lost uh, jobs and people. And I dare say many pe- cities around the world have lost people. But suburban or rural areas, that's where people are, they're rethinking their values. And I need to be a pl- in a place where there's space, uh, where I can be with family, friends, and so on. And I need to be a, in a home that um, I, I can be safe in as well. So that, that's a huge value shift going on um, it, that has been significantly affected by COVID. Lisa, where do you see this playing out? Because clearly the future of work has shifted immeasurably over the last 15 months. And I know you're on top of it and the leading edge of it, but surely you didn't even see this massive change coming. Yeah, so it's really common that you'll hear that, you know, what the pandemic has done is it's surfaced issues that people have known about or trends that people have known about for a long time and then accelerated them. But I think that it's more meaningful to um, go past that kind of very easy and platitude kind of statement um, and dig into what I think is at the core of what uh, all the rest of my co-hosts have been circulating around. And that's really a concept of agency. So over the course of the pandemic, there has been individual impact on all of us. Uh, And as Sarah says, some negative with loss and with a a reckoning and having to make different types of decisions for some in positive ways. But I think one of the things that it has really shaken is the, the way that you're supposed to navigate through life. So Dave, the way that you are supposed to choose where you're going to live and what your relationship is between work and life and learning and time horizons. And should you take transit or shouldn't you? How do you make health related decisions? Because we've been put in the driver's seat in some ways to make all kinds of decisions without social cues, without being in contact with other people where we can see, well, how's everyone else making this decision? It's been very isolating to try to figure out okay, so how am I gonna make this decision for me and my family? And what is everyone else actually doing? We're really curious and we want that social proof that we're making the right choice. Those are in the areas where we've gained agency and all of a sudden we are in charge and in control with many more options available to us. The, The choice of where to live, for example, than possibly before. And others within the population have seen a significant decline in agency the you know, lack of ability to be able to make basic, simple decisions about when and where they will go to work. Is their work open? If it's not open, what's available to them? How do they navigate? All of a sudden, there's a limiting of choices. And so I think at the core of all of this and why it feels so personal is because it's impacted our sense of agency and how much control we actually have over our life in ways that are surprising to some and in ways that it can be taken away in a heartbeat in ways that people never anticipated at the beginning. Yeah, Dave, when we t- listened to what Lisa was talking about in terms of sort of the, the, um, when we address what would normally be something we take for routine, uh, 
getting on transit, for example, the real core of it, and perhaps, you know, Ujwal wants to comment on this too. We have changed our meaning, our sense of meaning of what comfort and confidence is. And we, that it brings to bear even more, for example, Dave, when we're talking about, you know, are we going to ride the subway tomorrow because it's going to get me there on time, but do I feel comfortable and confident that it's a, the right thing to do? Yes. And it, it, uh, in addition to the subway, uh, how do I go for a walk? Um, how do I go to my a park? I, I know in my own community, uh, I call it playing walk checkers, where <laughs> we, we, we want to make sure that we're on the other side of the road. So you can go down a long street and see people crossing all the way down because they just don't want to be close to those those other people. I, I wish I could give everybody a hug who uh, is social distancing, but that it isn't going to happen for a while. It's saying, but when we take our children to a park, how do we do that? Uh, so all these things that we normally uh, do, transit, parks, walking, we're reevaluating. And that's going to be with us for some time. Ujwal, how has that affected the sort of that, our perspective, that change in view of what our comfort zone, our, our, our confidence yeah. levels in doing some of these normal ritualistic things? Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why we study meaning so much is because as human beings, and th this is going to sound cynical, but it's not meant in that way. But as human beings, the reason we do things is because uh, there is capital associated with it. And that's sort of the reality of modern uh, capitalist life that we're part of, the structure that we're part of. So let me unpack that for a second. Uh, everything has meaning and meaning is is uh, a form of currency. We're not just accumulating wealth in terms of our actual bank accounts. We're also accumulating wealth constantly in terms of the symbolic wealth, the symbolic power we gain when we do certain things that that hold meaning in our lives. So as a classic example, going to the park for a picnic had a different amount of symbolic currency. Let's say it was five symbolic currency dollars in 2019. Today, it's 20 symbolic currency dollars. Uh, similarly, something else that was 20 symbolic currency dollars, like owning a product, has dropped in value symbolically. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because as human beings, that's what we're doing. We're tr constantly trading symbolically. We're trading these things. How do we trade? We trade by talking to one another about the things we do, the way we spend our time, the way we spend our lives. So we're constantly accumulating symbolic wealth and then we're trading that. And the reason we trade it is because we want to gain power, status, prestige, whether we acknowledge it or not, that's what we all do. And, and by the way, sociologically, there's you know, 100 years of research uh, proving all this out. So what's interesting to me is that because meanings are changing around, you know, to Dave's point, the, the walk to the park or meanings are changing around, you know, what it means to spend time with people, what it means to hug somebody or to touch somebody, because all of that is changing, the capital that comes with it is also changing. And as a result, there is a reevaluation of what we need to spend our time doing and how we need to then use that in order to you know feel part of communities or feel feel good about who we are i think that's that's interesting and it's it's driving a lot of change in behavior as well i want to pick up on that because i think that's a, i think you both make a really good point and i want to talk a little bit about you know adaptive management which is something that intrigues me a lot in the environmental world, but I think it's also really intriguing when you think about it in terms of human behavior. So, you know, Dave goes for a walk in down the local street in the local park, and he is um, thankful and gratified that, you know, the neighbors who are wearing masks actually jump over to the other side of the street. And you probably acknowledge them, Dave. I mean, we do that now. And this is something that I mean, before the pandemic, first of all, we never would have thought of not like jumping off a sidewalk and crossing to the other side of the street. That would have been rude behavior and not smiling at someone, not standing around talking, giving them a hug. But we have changed those behaviors and we have we've really acknowledged, I think, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the community I live in and the kind of chatter that I hear, we've really acknowledged the um, 
the recognition and the safety and the caring for each other because we've adopted these new behaviors. So Lisa, we're just about out of time here, but in the next, I want to take this into the next episode and talk about the return to work. So I want you to just kind of lead us into that because what Sarah said is really important and it's not just on the sidewalk. Riding an elevator all of a sudden becomes an issue in the towers in downtown Toronto. Are you confident that that the workplace is going to be able to accommodate that kind of sensitivity? We are adaptive and we do focus on these things. We will figure it out and it will be messy. Um, I think Ushwal actually raised a really good issue for the world of work as well, which is how do we recognize social capital if the you know thousand person trip to Vegas for the top salesperson is no longer the way that the reward happens? Do they still feel motivated and rewarded? So from, you know, right from when you walk in the door in the elevator and where you sit to how does the entire structure recognize this shift in values and what is the quote unquote new way we do things around here? How does that play out in terms of company culture? I think is fascinating and I can't wait to talk about it. Well, that was 20 minutes that kind of blew by in a hurry. And uh, I'm telling you, lots to chew on there. So you were listening. What did you learn from this episode? I I think my biggest takeaway was, you know, I mean, (laughs) I was taking copious notes and really engaged in listening. But the concept of agency, I had never really considered how the pandemic shifted that for us. And there was something that Lisa said about how, you know, our change in, um, agency and how being isolated and away from community and away from our workplaces really made us um, forced us to learn how to make decisions without social cues we were kind Mm -hmm. of all islands in and of ourselves and how I think that that is there's a lesson there and that was really a light bulb moment for me um, when I heard her put it that way I had never quite heard it put that way before well, and you just try to keep up you know, with all of them. Every time somebody would offer something into the conversation, it was like the second or third thing that comes to mind. Yeah. So I'm really anxious to hear how this discussion unfolds over the 12 parts of the series, because the next thing we do, uh, we're going to get into that whole idea now of the future of work. Talk about being isolated. We've done everything remotely for the most part. Now we're going to have to be pushed back into a place where do we continue remotely? What are the implications of that? And of course, the beauty of all that is that Lisa Taylor at Challenge Factory, um, well, she has all the expertise about the future of work. So we'll let her kick off that conversation in uh, in episode two. So if you like what you heard, feel free, subscribe. And for those of you who are new to the podcast thing, subscribing doesn't cost you money. You just go to Apple or iHeart or Google or Spotify or wherever it is, and you find the little button that says subscribe or follow, click it. And we go into your your feed. So it's as easy as that. And, uh, of course, we're always anxious to hear what you might have to say. Drop us a note, questions, ideas about other things that you want this big brain roundtable to deal with. Uh, That would be be terrific. So uh, I'm really looking forward to episode two. Yeah, me too. I I can't wait to dig into the future of work and, and hear what more brilliance our folks have to share with us. The Next Normal is sponsored by Challenge Factory, shaping the future of work. By Decision Partners. Our world is a better place when we make better decisions. By Motive Base, decoding implicit meaning behind what people talk about. And by Hardy Stevenson and Associates, planning the cities of the future. Comments, questions, or ideas for our hosts? Feel free to drop us an email at hello at storystudionetwork.com. This series is produced for the Story Studio Network by Eye Contact Productions.